we come into contact with things that are potentially poisonous every day. Acute poisonings affect 2 million people each year, and chronic poisoning is more common, and we'll discuss that a little bit. Deaths caused by poisoning are fairly rare. Poisoning in children has decreased steadily since the 1960s due to child-resistant caps. Death caused by chronic poisoning in adults have been rising as a result of drug abuse. Now, just real quick, keep in mind, children are better educated, parents are better educated. There's been a lot of public education done, the Mr. Yuck program, and people do know how to get a hold of poison control. And it's certainly something that we do educate new parents as uh, they're having children. And of course, we've seen a big rise in deaths from drug abuse, especially the opioids. Toxicology is a study of toxic or poisonous substances. A poison is any substance whose chemical reaction can damage body structures or impair body function. A toxin is a poisonous substance produced by bacteria, animals, or plants. So it's worth noting the two differences. Poison being chemical action, and a toxin is a substance that's produced. Substance abuse is the misuse of any substance to produce a desired effect. Now keep in mind, we do use substances for desired effects, but what we're talking about in the toxicological emergencies are the abuse of these substances. And of course, overdoses, you know, too much of a single drug or a group of drugs. Now, our primary responsibility as a patient is to recognize that poisoning has, been, has occurred. Pay attention to the surroundings. When you go in, especially with a patient that has an altered mental status, may be a little violent, quarrelsome, you want to take a good look at their surroundings. See if there is something in the surroundings that will tip us off to a possible poisoning or substance abuse whether it be alcohol, uh, marijuana, other drugs. And small, very small amounts of uh, poisonings, uh, some poisons can cause considerable damage or death. Now, you also want to be careful about being exposed to the poison yourself. And a good case in point is recently with fentanyl. There has been some fentanyl production inside homes. Caregivers and law enforcement have both been exposed to these opioids. Fentanyl is a manufactured opioid. And they've had untoward effects, even overdoses, to where police officers and emergency services, emergency medical personnel, have had to receive Narcan on scene. If you suspect an exposure to a toxic substance, make sure you get a hold of medical control and begin emergency treatment. Big thing is identify. Let's talk about that. Signs and symptoms of poisoning vary according to the specific agent. Presence of injuries at the patient's mouth suggests the ingestion of the poisoning, especially when we look for stuff that may burn the mouth, especially in children. And when you think about that, you think about maybe the chlorine bleaches, uh, battery acid, um, petroleum products. So something to keep in mind. I'd like to point out some things on this particular slide. And in particular, the opioids or the opiates and the opioids. Now, opiates such as morphine and, and codeine, and the opioids, heroin, methadone, oxycodone. These are going to produce signs and symptoms, specifically hypoventilation or respiratory arrest. Now that's peculiar uh, to the opioids. In the opioids, people stop breathing. They'll also have pinpoint pupils. They'll be sedated, meaning that they're kind of dopey, 
or in coma and always look for hypotension. Again, the drug that we use in this case is Narcan. Now, another one that we may see are the sympathomimetics. Now, remember what a sympathomimetic is. It mimics the flight or fight system inside the body. So when you think about that, you see that the patient's going to have hypertension, tachycardia, the dilated pupils. Remember, we talked about fight or flight in a previous lecture where the pupils dilate so they can bring in more light, agitation or seizures, uh, even hyperthermia, um, especially in these methamphetamines. And a lot of the rave drugs fall into this sympathomimetic category. So you might want to be uh, very concerned about these. And then you can kind of go over these aren't real um, what we see a whole lot anymore, but in the cholinergics, only because that we may see those in the shipyard perhaps. These are drugs like the organophosphates, and organophosphates in the past have been used in, in pesticides and insecticides, but they can also be used in nerve gas. So it's certainly a terrorist issue may uh, be something that we worry about. So we use a common mnemonic called SLEGEM. So S standing for salivation or sweating. Again, these patients will actually almost drown in their uh, fluids. Lacrima lacrimation, tearing of the eyes, urination, defecation, drooling and diarrhea for D, G, gastric upset and cramps, E, emesis, vomiting, and M is muscle twitching. So, if possible, ask the patient, what substance did you take? When did you take it? Or become exposed to it? Try to get a good idea of how much they ingested, inhaled, and did they have anything to eat or drink before or after they took or were exposed to the poison? Has anyone given them an antidote or any substance orally since they've ingested it? And keep in mind that in a lot of cases now, people do carry Narcan for opiate heroin overdoses and find out how much they weigh. And that's going to be important, especially if we talk to poison control, or the emergency department. Try to determine the nature of the poison. Look around the immediate area for clues. Are there syringes? Are there empty pill bottles? Place any suspicious material in a plastic bag and take it with you. Sometimes we'll see these people just pills all over the place. If you can't match them up to the bottle, Bring the bottles and the pills with you. So containers at the seat provide the critical information you will need to treat this patient. If the patient vomits, examine the contents for pill fragments. And that's really an important reason to have a container that they can vomit into. Make sure that you wear proper PPE so you don't get vomit on yourself and your face, ears, nose, mouth. And note and document anything unusual that you see. Again, document, documentation is always key. Emergency care for a patient may range from just reassuring a parent uh, that's anxious to actually performing CPR. Make sure that when you go in on these cases that you have everything you need to manage the case. Make sure that you have a suction, make sure you have something for them to vomit into, and even have your airway kit. So if you have to, you can provide bag valve, mask ventilation, and CPR if necessary. Definitive treatment can only be provided in the emergency department, but 
you may be able to administer an antidote. EMTs in Washington State can give Narcan, and you'll have a skill sheet and have to perform that in the lab coming up. The most important treatment you can perform is diluting or physically removing the poisonous agent. Now, what we do most of the time in this case is activated charcoal. Sometimes poison control will have you have them drink something. Uh, bleach, I know they've had uh, parents give their kids milk. So that's diluting the poison. How you provide treatment depends on how the poison got into the patient's body in the first place. There are four routes to consider. Inhalation, absorption, ingestion, and injection. So inhalation, in this case, we're seeing this guy inhale rubber cement, huffing, and absorption. So when we talk about absorption, we're talking about substances that can get on the skin and then absorb through the skin into the body system. Of course, ingestion, a very common route for a poison administration, and then injection. All four routes of poisoning can lead to serious and possibly life-threatening conditions, of course. If you're uncertain how to treat a patient, find the container if possible and contact medical control or the Poison Control Center. These are both resources that are available to us. Now, inhaled poisons. What we want to do is we want to get the patient into fresh air immediately. And by the way, be concerned for your own safety. So if you can smell it, you're inhaling it. The patient may require supplemental oxygen or may even require that you do bag valve ventilations. If you suspect the presence of a toxic gas, call for a specialized resource such as hazmat. Now, when we talk about toxic gas, the most common one is carbon monoxide. Use a self-contained breathing apparatus if you're trained to do so to protect yourself from any poisonous fumes. If you are not trained to use a self-contained breathing apparatus, an SCBA, make sure that you call people in who are trained and who can evacuate the patient for you. Some patients may be decontaminated by the hazmat team or a lot of engine companies are trained to do this. This is a basic hazmat um, skill and almost all of them require either brushing off the powder but nearly all of them require just rinsing off with water. All patients who have inhaled poisons require immediate transport. Again, make sure a suction unit is available and give them oxygen as needed. Some patients use inhaled poisons to commit suicide in a vehicle. So exhaust fumes contain high level of carbon monoxide or chemicals or detergent in a tightly sealed vehicle create a type of gas chamber. Now, what we've seen in the past is these chemical reactions that do this. A lot of times they'll show a film on the window, but we've even had, and we've had people who actually put a sign up in their window warning us that they've done this. Uh, another way besides um, the using the automobiles carbon monoxide, we've had a few people who've actually gotten charcoal grills and had charcoal grills burning inside their vehicles uh, and the carbon monoxide off of that have killed them. So keep in mind when you open the door you may be overcome as well. You have to be careful about that. Contact hazmat responders and have them remove the victim if you have to. Poisons that are absorbed in the skin in surface contact poisons. Now keep in mind they're the ones that are brought into the skin uh, 
the mucous membranes, the linings of the mouth and nose, or through the eyes and causing eye damage. Also be consider, uh, considerate of chemical burns. That's a type of poisoning. Rashes, lesions, systemic effects. It's important to distinguish between contact burns and contact absorption. So let's kind of look at the signs and symptoms. First off, of course, is a history of exposure. Liquid or powder on the patient's skin. We see any burns, itching, irritation, redness in the skin. Again, we have to remove clothing and look. Typical odors of the substance. And for the emergency treatment, first off, avoid contaminating yourself or others. Remove the substance from the patient as rapidly as possible and remove all contaminated clothing and flush and wash the skin. Now we've seen in the past where people forget to remove the clothing or cut the clothing on the front as they're laying on the stretcher, cut the clothing on the front off, but they're still laying on chemical soak, soak clo uh, clothing. You have to be careful about that. And again, flush and wash the skin. If there's a dry powder that's been spilled, brush off the powder, flood the area with water for 15, 20 minutes, then wash the skin with soap and water. If the liquid has been spilled onto the skin, flood for 15, 20 minutes. So powder, brush off first, and then rinse, liquids, rinse. Now, if a chemical agent is introduced into the eyes, we want to irrigate the eyes very thoroughly. And what you're seeing there is they're actually using a nasal cannula resting on the bridge of the nose to introduce saline solution, either through a syringe or through an IV bag that's hooked up to the end of it and pushing water through the eyes, going from the center outwards, laterally on both sides to rinse out the chemical or poison. Many chemical burns occur in industrial settings. So safety showers and specific protocols for handling surface burns may be available. Normally, people who work in an area should have the MSDS sheets available for you to look at, and they may have even started first aid. Now, hazmat team should be available to assist. Again, the fire departments are all trained to the operations level. Ensure that you, your team, and the patient are thoroughly decontaminated. So after decontamination, decontamination, promptly transport the patient to the emergency department for definitive care. And again, get those MSDSs, that's the material safety data sheets for the chemical that you're dealing with. About 80% of poisonings is by mouth, ingested. And these are different liquids, household cleaners, Contaminated food, and keep in mind when we talk about contaminated food, we also include contaminated water, plants, and drugs. Usually it's accidental in children and deliberate in adults. So the signs and symptoms vary with the type of poison, the age and weight of the patient, the time that's passed since the ingestion. Signs and symptoms may include burns around the mouth. We talked about this before, gastrointestinal pain, vomiting, cardiac dysrhythmias. Again, that's an ALS issue and seizures. And seizure patients from poisonings should be seen by a paramedic. So treat signs and symptoms and then notify poison control and or medical control of the patient's condition. Consider whether there's an unabsorbed poison remaining in the gastrointestinal tract and whether you can safely and effectively prevent its absorption. Now, when we talk about safely uh, preventing absorption, we're talking about using activated charcoal. So EMTs in Kitsap County are allowed to use activated charcoal. Now, in the past, we've used activated charcoal with a, a additive called sorbitol. Sorbitol is in a class 
called cathartics, meaning that it helps move things through the system. Sorbitol, you probably have had it. It's, it's aspartame. It's an artificial sweetener. And they use this not to sweeten the charcoal, but to use it to push it through the system. We don't really use activated charcoal with um, that anymore, so you should just be getting regular charcoal. And by the way, this is given at 50 milligrams is the adult dose, 50 milligrams. Look at me right with my mouse. Okay, so always immediately assess the ABCs of every patient who's been poisoned and activated charcoal should only be given to those patients who can swallow and have control of their airway. Very important. Even though when we think about injected poisons, we normally think about intravenous drug use, but also remember that envenomation by insects, spiders, reptiles, snakes, are also injected poisons. They usually absorb quickly into the body or cause intense local tissue destruction. These can't be diluted or removed from the body in the field. Signs and symptoms of injected poisons will, may include weakness, dizziness, fevers, chills, unresponsiveness or stuporousness, excitability. Make sure you monitor the airway, provide high flow oxygen, bag valve va mask ventilations if you have to be alert to vomiting and nausea. Make sure you have your suction available. Especially when it comes to like snake bites, you wanna remove the rings, watches and bracelets from the area around the injection site if swelling occurs. Especially in snake bites, there will be swelling. You might wanna get those jewelry items off earlier than later. So let's look at the scene size up. Well, a well-trained dispatcher can take some information on a poisoning call. That'll include what proper protection may be needed, as in a carbon monoxide uh, issue, information pertaining to the mechanism of injury or nature of illness, number of patients involved. Again, if you have a carbon monoxide filling a home, you can have more than one patient. What additional resources would be needing a dispatcher, well-trained dispatcher will know that some of these will be a hazmat response, whether trauma is involved. Take standard precautions and look for clues that indicate, again, the substance involved. And again, a lot of times this is done from a doorway, looking in or calling into the house and asking the question, what is wrong? patient and crew safety is very important. So ask yourself the following questions. Is there an odor in the room? Is the scene safe? Are there medication bottles lying around? Is there medication missing that might indicate an overdose? Alcoholic beverage containers present? And again, people tend to just not overdose, especially intentional overdose, on one thing. They may mix different drugs or drugs with alcohol. Are there syringes or other drug paraphernalia in the scene? And be careful not to get yourself stuck. If there's a suspicious odor that may indicate a presence of a drug laboratory, anything sour or uh, acrid smelling, you might want to back out and let hazmat and law enforcement move in and take a look before you try to remove or take care of patients. In your primary assessment, determine the severity of the patient's condition. Get a general impression. Are they conscious? Are they talking to you? Are they breathing adequately? Determine any life threats. Again, just don't look for one thing, look for multiple things, as in possibly trauma, stabbing, gunshot wound. And don't assume a conscious patient uh, is in stable condition. Ensure the patient has an open airway, adequate breathing. Again, this is a case where you'd want to bring your airway kit in and be able to back valve ventilate as soon as possible. Begin oxygen therapy, have suction available. Again, 
If these patients are going to vomit, you want to be able to suction their airway. Make sure you assess the skin condition and pulse and make a transport decision. Does the patient need to be transported immediately? Are there things that you can do there on scene before you run off to the hospital? Do you need to wait for ALS? How far is ALS out? Everyone who's exposed to the hazardous material must be thoroughly decontaminated by the hazmat team before leaving the area. And keep in mind, we had a case not too long ago where a person went into cardiac arrest in kind of a boat shed that's uh, out at Brownsville Marina where a guy was operating a generator inside this enclosed boat tent, if you will. And he became overcome. His neighbors know some lying there. They went in to try to help. They were doing CPR. And while they were doing CPR on the gentleman, they got themselves gassed themselves. So they were treated on scene as well as the person who was in cardiac arrest from the carbon monoxide poisoning. It's important to take a good uh, history, get you know the chief in complaint, figure out what it is, and get a sample history. If the patient is unresponsive, obtain history from coworkers, their bystanders, friends, family. Look for medical jewelry, the medical alert tags in particular that they may wear on their wrist, ankle, or on a neck necklace around their uh, neck, or a wallet card. Try to figure out what their past history is. Make sure you get the sample and ask the following questions. What was the substance involved? And just don't consider only one substance. When did the patient become exposed to it or ingest it? How much, how long? These are all important questions that both poison control would ask and medical control when you call in. Has the patient or a bystander perform any intervention? Again, these are issues where patients may have Narcan to be given. See if any, anything like that's been given to them before you get there. And how much does the patient weigh? Again, a lot of these drugs, a lot of these poisons are weight dependent for their overdose dosage. You know, secondary assessment Focus on the area of the body involved with the poisoning or the route of exposure. A general review of all body systems may help identify a systemic problem and complete a set of baseline vital signs. Again, look for alterations in the level of consciousness, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and of course, skin. Reassess the adequacy of the ABCs, correct as you need to in your reassessment, repeat vital signs, Again, if the patient's stable every 15 minutes, unstable every five minutes, or constantly for the patient who's consumed a harmful, harmful or lethal dose. Again, sometimes you have to have an all hands crew working on your patient. Treatment, support the ABCs. It's the most important task. Contact medical control or poison control to discuss treatment options. We want to dilute airborne exposures with oxygen, remove uh, contact exposures with water, and consider activate charcoal per protocol for ingestions. And communicate and document what you've seen, what you've given. So for emergency medical care, again, ensure scene safety, follow standard precautions, perform external decontamination, remove tablets or fragments from the patient's mouth, wash or brush the patient, uh, poisons from the patient's skin, assess and maintain the ABCs, provide oxygen, perform assisted ventilations if necessary, treat for shock, and transport the patient promptly to the nearest hospital. Again, don't forget to call ALS, either wait for them on scene or rendezvous. Some EMS systems allow EMTs to give activated charcoal by mouth. We are one of them. Again, when in doubt, call medical control. And medical control is on again, off again with 
giving activated charcoal. Now, activated charcoal works by binding to specific toxins, which are then carried out of the body in the stool. It's not indicated for patients who have ingested alkalis, cyanide, ethanol, which is a type of uh, alcohol, iron, which by the way, we see in multivitamins, lithium, methanol, another type of alcohol, mineral acids, or organic solvents. Again, when in doubt, call poison control or medical control. Those who have a decreased level of consciousness and cannot protect their airway should not be given activated charcoal. Depending where you work, you may carry activated charcoal. And you want to be very careful that you're giving 50 grams, by the way, it's not 50 milligrams, it's 50 grams of activated charcoal. And the product names would be like Instachar, Actidose, Liquichar. The usual dose for an adult or child is one mill, excuse me, one gram per kilogram of body weight up to that 50 grams. Keep in mind that lately I've seen on some ambulances activated charcoal, but it's only 25 grams. So it's only half a dose. So be really cogniz cognizant of that when you're giving activated charcoal. Before you give a patient charcoal, obtain approval from medical control, shake the bottle vigorously. And by the way, it's really important that you shake the activated char charcoal in the mornings when you do your rig check, and I'll tell you why. Some of them don't have anti-clumping agents inside the activated charcoal. So if you have activated charcoal sitting inside your ambulance or drug box, after a while, it'll build up like a charcoal clump, a briquette inside the bottle. And trying to break that up in order to give the full dose takes a while. If you during rig check, shake it up in the morning. Make sure that it's good and broken up. You shouldn't have any trouble with it for the rest of the shift. Now you may need to convince the patient to drink it. Never force them to drink it. Again, most people, if you coach them, will go ahead and, and take it. Thing is, you're going to probably have to introduce it to the back of the throat with the tube and have them drink it down. We normally get everybody around and cheer them, cheer them along. You know, drink, 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 chug, 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 chug. You know, and then we yell, yay, when they're all done. So keep in mind that they may vomit this. And activated charcoal does wash out, but it's messy. So make sure that you bib the patient and make sure that you have something uh, like a blue gown around yourself when you're giving it. So if the patient refuses activated charcoal, document the refusal and transport for further evaluation. Side effects uh, are constipated in black stool. And we have in the past had the charcoal challenge in the EMT class, and it makes for very interesting side effects. If the patient has ingested a poison that causes nausea, he or she may vomit after the char after taking charcoal, which means that the dose will have to be repeated. So when in doubt, you know, call medical control. If you think that they're going to vomit it up, don't give it to them, especially if you're fairly close to the hospital. So let's talk about some, to wrap this up, I'm just going to talk about a couple specific poisons. Over time, a person who re routinely misuses a substance may need increasing amounts of it to achieve the same result. That's referred to as tolerance. A person with an addiction, opioids in particular, uh, alcohol, they'll need to have more to get the same effect that they've had, have had in the past because of tolerance. And they'll crave it enough to where they'll try to get it at any cost. Almost any substance can be abused including chocolate. The importance of safety awareness 
and standard precautions can't be overemphasized. Known users have a highly, fairly high incidence of serious and undiagnosed infections, including HIV and especially hepatitis. So always wear the appropriate PPE and expect the unexpected, especially if patients all of a sudden become violent. Just a couple specific alcohol. Uh, one in 10 deaths among working age adults in the United States can be attributed to excessive alcohol use. Alcohol can damage the liver, whether through chronic use or occasional heavy use, binge drinking. Some of you might have done that in college. Binge use can uh, be more damaging than chronic use, depending on the frequency. And we really have seen some really bad alcohol overdoses in the binge users. Binge users, if they're unconscious, decreased level of consciousness. I've known guys in the past, including myself, who, hey, can you watch this guy? We're not going to take him to the hospital. To the point where, you know, if they have a decreased level of consciousness and they can't fend for themselves, you have to take them in. Alcohol decreases activity and excitement, induces sleep, dulls the sense of awareness, slows reflexes. You, most of you know this already, maybe even personally. Uh, it can cause aggressiveness, inappropriate behavior. Some of you are self-conscious right now and a lack of coordination. Alcohol increases the effect of other drugs and is com commonly taken with other substances. Again, with marijuana and as a overdose with intentions of suicide. So you have to provide respiratory support, be ready for vomiting, meaning suction, internal bleeding should be considered the patient appears to be in shock, especially those patients who have long-term abuse and maybe have liver damage. Patients may experience frightening hallucinations or delirium tremens, especially when they're coming off alcohol use. They haven't had a drink in a while and they're trying to break themselves. So those delirium tremens, again, as they're coming off or withdrawing from alcohol, agitation, restlessness, fever, sweating, tremors, which are shaking while remaining conscious, confusion, disorientation, delusions, hallucinations, uh, bugs crawling on them, or the feeling of blood, bugs crawling on them, slap at their um, face and their arms, trying to get bugs off, and then possibly seizures. Again, seizures are the shaking without consciousness. Let's talk about the opioids. An opi opioid is a type of narcotic medication used to relieve pain. An opiate is a subset of the opioid family and refers to natural non-synthetic opioids. It's named after opium and poppy seeds and from which codeine and morphine are derived. So synthetic opioids would include meperidine, hydromorphone, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and methadone. These are things that are commonly or have been commonly in the past prescribed in some cases over prescribed for pain relief. Prescription opioids are among the most commonly abused drugs in the United States. We know this by now. Some people become physically dependent on opioids and it's been a problem actually from a very, very long time. The death rate from heroin overdoses tripled between uh, 2010 to 2013. In fact, when I got out of uh, paramedic school in 1988, the whole time up to that time as in paramedic school, I'd only seen one heroin overdose. I've seen several uh, in the last five years. So it's becoming way more common. Now these are CNS depressants and can cause respiratory depression. So 
They build up a tolerance quickly. Some users may require massive doses to experience the same high, often causes nausea and vomiting, especially in patients who are taking it clinically, and it could lead to hypotension. Again, we might want to be ready to treat for shock and liver bag valve ventilations. Seizures are uncommon, they, but they can occur, and patients typically appear sedated or unconscious and cyanotic with pinpoint pupils. Naloxone is the antidote that reverses the effects of opioid, opiates and opioid overdose. Now, we give it normally intranasally as EMTs. In Washington State and in Kitsap County, we're trained and make it available for EMTs to give. In fact, law enforcement even gives it with very minimal training. And again, it's also given to people um, by prescription in case they do overdose. Should be only used with a patient that has agonal respirations or is apneic. Don't be so anxious to use naloxone that you forget to do the basics. Placing noropharyngeal airway, keeping the patient's airway open, and providing bag valve ventilation. Again, these people either have depressed respirations or none at all. So we have to breathe for them. So EMTs can give Narcan intranasally, and you may even want to find out if somebody's given it to them already. Since marijuana has become legalized, we've seen a decrease in the use of bath salts for getting high. Again, it gives a, a similar sensation, increases mental clarity, euphoria, sexual arousal, uh, most uh, users of this drug snort it, um, and the effects can last as long as 48 hours. So, adverse effects, teeth grinding, appetite loss, muscle twitching, lip smacking, confusion, gastrointestinal conditions, paranoia, headache, elevated heart rate, hallucination, turns people into very attractive individuals. Keep the patient calm in transport. ALS may be required to chemically restrain the patient. These are patients that will end up getting a drug, probably a ketamine or perhaps a drug called Versed. Marijuana, it's uh, used and abused. Nearly half of Americans, if not more, have tried marijuana. THC is the chemical in the marijuana plant that produces the high, produces euphoria, relaxation, drowsiness, and an unusual craving for Doritos. Impairs short-term memory and the capacity to do complex thinking. And could progress to depression, confusion, especially in the long-term users. With very high doses, uh, the patient can hallucinate uh, if some of you have experienced that, let, let me know. Reassure the patient and transport with a minimal amount of excitement. So marijuana is often used uh, as a vehicle to get other drugs into the body. So keep in mind, several states have legalized this. Uh, they have edibles. We have edibles that are now infused. And I'll just talk about a couple quick cases here. And just in marijuana can lead to a cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which they're dry heaving constantly. So let's uh, just finish up here. So, uh, the synthetic marijuana or spice, very similar to what we experience with bath salts now that marijuana is legalized. We're seeing less and less use of this. So. It's powerful, unpredictable, and can cause a complete loss of consciousness. This is actually somewhat serious. 
So let's just talk about a couple cases. Let's talk about the edibles. Keep in mind that you have a group of people that are in their late 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, or in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Remember the good days of marijuana use. In fact, back in the, the 70s and 80s, uh, you're kind of sticking it to the man by uh, using marijuana. It's very popular. And just by circumstance, people stopped using this through, normally they're raising their children, uh, they don't want their children exposed to it, so they stop using it. And now that's legalized, they want to dip their toe back into their teenage and uh, teenage years, or their 20s, and they want to try it again. Well, keep in mind too, that these are people who don't realize that the marijuana now is so much more potent than the Indiana ragweed that we were smoking back in the 70s. So this much more potent marijuana, they smoke a little bit and they're, they're stupid. And there's nothing worse than having stupid grandma and grandpa. But on top of it, keep in mind that these people are on other medications. And a lot of times they don't take this into consideration that they're on other medications. When the marijuana is introduced, it could make an effect that is totally not what they expected. And a lot of times it's excitement and agitation, tachycardia, shortness of breath. You have to be expecting that. And these are patients that you have to just kind of talk them down, take them to the hospital, support them as much as, as you can. Another thing is with the edibles. People who try edibles for the first time don't realize that it takes a while for the THC to absorb inside the gut. And it's some of it's in, um, absorbed in the stomach, but most in the small intestine. It takes a while for it to get there. So they have a little bit of the, few of the gummy bears, they're not working. They're not getting as stoned as quickly as they thought they should. So they take some more and then some more, and then they get the overdose. So just be aware of that. So that completes uh, the short lecture on toxicology and toxicological emergencies. Um, Please forward me any questions by email uh, or if we are having a group meeting, uh, which for EMT class 2020-1 is uh, this evening, uh, bring your questions with you. So thanks for watching and we will visit with you soon.